Movies can have a profound effect on people and even society as a whole. They can have an emotional impact like Titanic, or highlight a social problem like Parasite. One movie in Japan, however, unraveled a case that shook the country to its very foundations. This is the true, solved story of the Kyoto Gobancho incident. I've been waiting so long to make a video on this case, and it is one that has many layers to it. And while there is, unfortunately as usual, almost no information on the subject of the video, I'll do my best to provide as much detail as I can. I hope you find it interesting. If you're a returning viewer or someone new to the channel, welcome. I make videos on Japanese cases, strange, solved and unsolved. If that sounds like something you think you'll find interesting, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications. In any case, let's get on with the video. Today, Kyoto is most famous for its tourist attractions. Places like the beautiful temple complex of Kiyomizu Dera, the striking gold pavilion Kinkakuji, and the stunning Arashiyama bamboo forests are all wonderful, unforgettable sights to behold. While certainly not a tourist attraction, there was once another place in Kyoto a long time ago that used to attract visitors. Visitors of a very different kind. A place few Japanese, and even fewer foreigners, have ever even heard of. A place called Gobancho. Gobancho was a town located in the Kamigyoku district of Kyoto. I say was because it technically no longer exists today, at least not in the same capacity as it once did. Established during the Edo period as a pleasure and entertainment district for men, particularly for lower class craftsmen who used to work in the area, its streets were bustling and its businesses were booming for many years. Restaurants, bars and entertainment houses lined up along the streets one after the other and visitors started coming in from all over the city, resulting in it becoming very well known and the popular place in Kyoto to unwind after a hard day's work. Given the nature of the establishments, drunk scuffles, disruptive shouting matches, touting and dubious activities became a staple of Gobancho and earned it an infamous reputation. After World War II and the restructuring of the country, it was renamed to Nishijin Shinchi, but it wasn't until 1958 when the post-occupation government introduced new laws to clamp down on harlotry that Gobancho businesses were forced to cease operation entirely, and the once thriving part of the city was gone almost in an instant. Some tea houses and remnants of its past remain today, many repurposed for other more accepting businesses and homes, but most of the place was demolished and turned into a residential area for families. A famous Japanese novel named Gobancho Yugiriro, later adapted into a popular movie, keeps memory of the old town alive, but after such a long time it is mostly forgotten now. In its place a quiet, ordinary area with very little going on really. Three years before its demolition, however, an unfortunate incident occurred that changed Japan forever. An incident that is still brought up to this very day. On Sunday the 10th of April 1955, the 30th year of the Showa era, two brothers and two of their friends were drinking together in a bar during the late hours. Nothing is really known about them except for the name and age of one, 20 year old car assistant Osamu Kinoshita, who was the younger of the two brothers. They had been drinking for a long time, and by nightfall they were already quite inebriated. It is said that they were really enjoying themselves, laughing, joking and chatting the night away. The four of them kept to themselves on the table that was almost never free of a glass. They were certainly noisy, but other than Osamu having an altercation and punching a fellow patron stranger when they stumbled into each other, things were fairly standard for a gobancho business, even if a female worker had to step in to put an end to it. Eventually the four men staggered out of the bar to go and drink at another establishment. Immediately upon doing so, they encountered a group of four male students in uniform walking past in the street. Now, since we have two groups of four, things could get confusing. So from now on I will refer to the group that was drinking at the bar as the friend group and the students that they just met after leaving as the student group. The exact details are unknown, but the friend group, in their drunken state and against their better judgement, shouted out to the student group, telling them in a teasing way that they were too young to be in such an area. It seems the friend group goaded the student group, and unfortunately a fight ensued in the middle of the street. It is said that the friend group were typically honest, nice people, but they had gone way over their limit that night and became reckless. As stated by the older brother later, the brothers in particular change into different people after consuming a large number of drinks, and not for the better. The friend group were no match for the student group in their state, and quickly began to lose. Sensing the danger and understanding what a terrible mistake they had made, the friends started to flee. 
As the students ran after the friends from in front of the bar, some shouted things like, Get them! Or, You're done for! Which were heard by a woman observing the altercation from in front of the establishment the friends had just left. The friend group split into two, and the two brothers frantically ran through the dark streets and alleys as fast as their drunk legs could carry them, but the students pursued them relentlessly. They were not happy. The older brother led, while the younger brother Osamu followed behind. Osamu was not as fast, stumbled around, and slowly the gap between them grew. Seeing him as the easier target, the student group focused their pursuit on Osamu. Eventually, Osamu bumped into a stranger in the darkness of the street and, after some shouting that was heard by the student group, fell to the floor just before the students caught up with him. Osamu would have difficulty against just one of the students, but he was certainly no match for four. Annoyed with the friend group, especially Osamu who had been the one who stirred the confrontation up the most, the students let him have it immediately. Once they became tired and felt like they got their own back, they walked away and left Osamu on the ground, groaning. The older brother, who had been running for so long, stopped and looked behind him down the dark street. It was here when he realised that his younger brother was nowhere to be seen. He looked around but couldn't locate him, and never would. Little did he know that this fateful night would be the last time he ever spoke to Osamu. At around 11pm that same night, the Nishiji police received a terrible report. Somebody has collapsed after being stabbed in Gobancho. Officers went down to the scene, but the person had by this point already been taken to the Niseki Hospital, or Red Cross Hospital, so they went there 30 minutes later at 11.30. There was Osamu. Sadly, his situation was dire. His brother was also there, and was interviewed by authorities to find out what happened to cause this terrible thing. He relayed what had occurred with the student group, and officers went to Gobancho to interview witnesses to better understand the situation. After speaking to the woman who overheard the student group shouting threatening things at the friend group before giving chase, the authorities were surprisingly able to quickly track down the four students and bring them in for questioning early the next morning on the 11th of April. All four students soon confessed to that night's events under individual questioning and their stories corroborated with those of the older brother and the witnesses. The students said that once they caught up with Osamu, they used their fists and feet to enact their revenge. But there was one particular thing, perhaps the most important thing that they all denied. They all completely rejected stabbing Osamu. They utterly refuted any indication that they had been involved in that action, and none of them implicated anyone else either. In fact, they seemed surprised that such a thing had happened, as if they were completely unaware that it had even occurred at all. They admitted to beating Osamu after the friend group had stirred up trouble, and were even defensive in how it was not the students themselves who had started it, but they claimed to know nothing about the blade wounds. Direct quotes include things like, We caused injuries that night, but we absolutely didn't use a knife. After being interviewed one by one, they said they didn't carry a knife, didn't use one, didn't know what happened, and if someone had done something, it wasn't them. They all had the exact same story. An unnamed head detective at the Nishijin police force merely believed that they were protecting each other by lying. He believed that they were responsible for this. Clearly, by their own admission and witness testimony, they had attacked Osamu. The students had also admitted to drinking themselves while under questioning, and some of them had admitted that this could have caused them to forget what had happened that night. While the authorities were gathering evidence and thinking of a strategy on how to get the truth out of the students, some awful news came in. On the 12th of April, two days since the incident, 20-year-old Osamu had sadly succumbed to his wounds. What should have been a fun night with friends and family turned into a sad tragedy. While the friend group had acted in an aggressive and antisocial way that was not appropriate at all, Osamu didn't deserve this outcome, especially when we consider how much drinking had clouded his judgement here. With Osamu's passing, things got much more serious, and this was now a murder inquiry. The investigation would also have to change hands, meaning that the Kyoto Prefectural Police Force would take charge, and instead the local Nishijin police would be forced to follow orders and provide support. Nishijin police were not authorised to handle serious cases like this after all, so it had to be transferred to the main force in the prefecture, as was standard practice at the time. Detectives from the Kyoto Prefectural Headquarters came down to the area to take charge of the investigation. And when they did, they were very secretive, 
keeping information away from the Nishijin police and not sharing details on the progress of the investigation, despite the obvious benefits of cooperating together and operating in an area where the Nishijin police had lots of knowledge and experience. After nine long days of interrogation by the authorities, one of the students finally talked. He confessed to having committed the crime and that the knife had been thrown into the sewer system via a manhole near the scene of the incident, so detectives raced down to the spot at once. Nishijin officers were tasked by the prefectural detectives with finding it and bringing it in to be used as evidence. They opened the manhole up and searched relentlessly for four hours in the filthy sewage. But they were enthusiastic because if they could find it, it would solve the crime. After sifting through bucket after bucket of wastewater, they eventually gave up. It wasn't there. They theorized that it could have washed away, but they had no idea what the truth was. Disappointed, they returned to the station empty-handed. Fortunately, a different student also talked a few days later. They also claimed that they had committed the awful crime and that they threw the knife in a nearby forest. It seems strange that someone else would own up to it, but since the first confession seemed to be a dead end, maybe this one was promising. Once again, Nishijima authorities were tasked with searching the designated area. After hours of looking, hours of combing through the grass and leaves, they once again turned up nothing. But this was only the beginning. Eventually, all students one by one confessed to ending Osamu's life and gave locations of where the blade could be. In total, they pointed out over 30 different locations all over Kyoto, every single one of which had to be thoroughly searched. Officers combed through the Kamogawa River, the mountains, everywhere, all of which did not contain the item that was seen as key to the investigation, the crux of the inquiry that could solve the crime. The Nishijin police, as mentioned previously, were kept away from the details of the case by the investigating detectives from the prefectural headquarters, so they were puzzled and irritated by what was happening, believing that the students were taking them for fools or something. That the students were intentionally wasting their time by lying about the location of the knife. With the detectives left with nothing but frustration, eventually the students were sent to the prosecutors without much physical evidence, save for some blood stains on the students' trousers that matched the type of the victim, blood type O. And on the 3rd of June, 1955, the four were indicted at the Kyoto Public Prosecutor's Office for unlawfully inflicting bodily injury resulting in death. It would be a long trial. Despite admitting to the crime during investigations, right from the beginning of the proceedings, all four students vehemently denied being involved in Osama's sad passing. But it was in the trial's final moments in April 1956, a year since the incident, when they all gave passionate speeches on how they had not caused Osama's death, even though they readily admitted to being involved in the altercation. And there's more. Since the details of the investigation by the prefectural police were not shared among local officers, new information was revealed during the trial. On the 17th of May 1956, at least two of the students claimed during their testimonies that an unknown man wearing a white turtleneck shirt with a navy blue double-breasted business suit had intervened in their pursuit of Osamu, punched him, drew a knife, and committed that terrible action for which they are on trial for. In other words, a mysterious man was responsible, not them. However, all four claimed it was too dark to see the stranger's face or what had happened exactly, so they couldn't provide any information on defining features that could help identify him. In fact, other than the general description of his clothing, appearance and actions, they could offer no other evidence to back this up. The story was quickly dismissed as being a lie and considered to be nothing more than excuses by the court. However, something happened that no one expected. During the sixth public hearing on the 26th of February 1956, a previously unknown witness came forward to give testimony. A 20-year-old woman named Yasuko Muramatsu contacted the authorities with some very interesting information. On the evening of the incident, Yasuko went to the famous Hirano Shrine with her younger sister to enjoy viewing the cherry blossoms, or sakura as they are known in Japanese. This activity, or hanami, is a popular practice in Japan. They had intended to go with their 17-year-old friend Kazuyo Sato, but she wasn't home, so the pair went alone instead. While returning home at around 10.40pm, Yasuko stopped off at a nearby public toilet to wash her hands. As she was doing so, an unknown man also entered and barged his way past her. 
According to the woman, at the sink approximately 4-5 to five meters away from her, he washed a blood-stained knife and a hand towel. Her description of the man's appearance and clothing was an exact match for what the students had said in their testimonies. Some of her direct quotes include, It happened at around 10.40pm when I was washing my hands at a public toilet on the corner of Kamicho Jamachi. I saw a young man washing a bloody hand towel and a knife. He was wearing a turtleneck shirt, a navy blue suit, and tall boots. And she also said, there were two stains on the hand towel, and blood was dripping from them. This seemed like a breakthrough for the defense. The witness corroborated what the students had said during the trial, and with nothing really proving that the students had committed the act against Osamu, it had the potential to tip the balance in the defense's favor. However, the authorities had some doubts. The incident was said to have taken place at around 10.40pm, when the area was pitch black under the night sky. Back then, there were no streetlights in such residential areas, meaning it was very dark. They thought it would have been impossible for Yasuko to witness such a thing from a distance of 4-5 to five meters. In response to this, Yasuko claimed that she could also smell the blood, that the distinctive metallic smell filled the toilet area. However, authorities considered this unlikely, and became suspicious that the story seemed to change from seeing blood to smelling it when doubt was cast upon her testimony. But there was more. Right after encountering the man, Yasuko and her sister came across their friend Kazuyo in the street in front of a bookstore. Yasuko immediately told the friend of the strange incident, but there was some confusion about the location of the public toilet after the friend was interviewed by the authorities. When police conducted an on-site investigation together with Yasuko, she seemed to act strangely, and the public toilet was 500 meters away from where Yasuko said it was, which further cast doubt on her testimony. And it goes further. Kazuyo told her ping-pong partner about Yasuko's encounter with a strange man in the toilet, and that someone, a male friend of hers named Masami Nishimura, just so happened to be an acquaintance of the students. In fact, he was the housemate of one of them, so he knew the case very well. Immediately upon hearing about this toilet incident, the two went to Yasuko and begged her to tell the authorities of what she saw and to testify in court on the student's behalf. When the court heard about this, they really became suspicious. They believed it to be a fabricated witness testimony, that Yasuko and her friends had made it up to try and help the students get away with their crimes. To them, it couldn't be a coincidence that Masami lived with one of the students. On the 1st of March 1956, Yasuko and her father were called in for questioning by the Kyoto public prosecutor named Chuzo Morishima. Yasuko had to travel all the way from her workplace in Nagano at a moment's notice. They were both interrogated from 10.30am until 2am the following morning, when Yasuko was eventually arrested for perjury, but let go on the same day. Yes, she had been questioned and issued an arrest warrant. After the investigation, when it was issued, she was quoted as saying, While testifying under oath as a witness, I gave false testimony that I saw a man wearing a felt hat, a navy blue double-breasted business suit over a white turtleneck shirt, and tall boots washing a blood-stained towel. She had lied. She admitted that she made the entire story up. Her testimony was thrown out. And with that, it seemed like an open and shut case. The defendants had admitted to beating Osamu and although they changed their story to include the mysterious stranger in a suit and a white shirt, the students had confessed to committing the crime under interrogation. A female witness at the scene had also heard the students shouting threatening things such as we'll get you before giving chase, which implied intent to commit the horrible deed to the court. With Yasuko who corroborated the students' stories now saying that she had lied, the defendants had no evidence to back up their claims of innocence. And while the trial wasn't over, the authorities had pretty much made up their minds. It wasn't looking good for the four students at all. On the 27th of March 1956, a movie entitled Mahiru no Ankoku, or Darkness at Noon, was released in Japan, and it became a very popular must-see movie. Directed by Tarashi Imai, it is a non-fiction film based on a best-selling book written by lawyer Hiroshi Masaki about the Yakai incident. It's a case I definitely want to do a detailed video on in the future, but in short, the Yakai incident concerns the murder of two elderly people in Yamaguchi Prefecture in 1951. 
Fingerprints on a bottle left at the scene led investigators to the culprit, who quickly confessed to the crime. However, the police were convinced that multiple people were involved, so forced the culprit to name other people while under interrogation. Even though he did it completely alone and admitted as much, he was coerced by police and tempted by the prospect of a lighter sentence into naming four others, four of his close friends. Police arrested the innocent four men and relentlessly interrogated and tortured them into confessing to being involved, even though many officers knew they were not responsible. Long story short, they were imprisoned for nearly a decade before finally being released without charge, and it was thanks to the aforementioned lawyer's book that they were eventually freed. The lawyer wrote about all the inconsistencies, the biased actions, the lack of evidence, which exposed the police's terrible deeds and proved the men's innocence. It's a sad true story that is still discussed today. People flocked to the cinemas to see this movie. It predominantly followed the story of one of the innocent men who was desperately trying to fight for his freedom, to fight so that he would not be punished for a crime he did not commit. As an audience member, you sympathize and root for the person, especially when you see the horrible things he has to go through. It is a movie that really tugs at the heartstrings. In its closing scene, after the innocent protagonist is found guilty and given the death sentence, his disappointed mother leaves after visiting him in prison. In a heartbreaking display of emotion, he screams at her, Mother, we still have the Supreme Court. We still have the Supreme Court before the end card appears. It is said that when the movie closed, the sounds of sobbing could be heard in the cinemas. Both men and women were said to have tears streaming down their faces after witnessing what those men went through in this dramatization of a very real case. But there was one man, just one, who watched this movie and felt something very different, something unique that no one else felt, guilt. On the 4th of April 1956, a young man suddenly showed up at the Kyoto Public Prosecutor's Office with a lawyer named Yoshihiro Taniguchi. He introduced himself as Hisao Sato, and the 20-year-old asked to meet with the detective in charge of the Gobancho incident at once. Right from the beginning of the meeting, the detective showed Hisao the newspapers with articles about the case. He showed the writings about the student's story of a mysterious stranger in a turtleneck shirt and suit, or the fifth person, and showed the story of the female witness who had lied to the authorities. It seemed that the detective thought that something similar was going to happen with Hisao, that he was part of a plan by the students to tell a false story to get them off the hook, to allow the guilty students to walk free. Why else would he be there after all? Hisao had seen these newspapers before. He knew them well, but not in a way the detective would expect. He became somber, and began to explain how he had recently seen the movie Mahiru no Ankoku. He told the detective how moving it was, how upsetting the final scene was, how it affected him personally. The detective was confused, but then Hisao did something very surprising, something that may well have changed Japanese society as a whole. Out of his bag, he pulled out a knife, a white turtleneck shirt, and a bloody hand towel. It was the murder weapon the towel used to wipe away the stains, and the shirt he was wearing on the day. Hisao Sato then confessed. He was the culprit. He was the one who did it. He was the one who killed Osamu Kinoshita. And with the evidence before the detective, it was hard to deny. It is said that the detective was utterly stunned in shock. Hisao was arrested, and the real story behind the case had finally come out. Hisao explained that the aforementioned film moved him so much, filled him with so much guilt and sadness at the thought of sending innocent people to jail, that he couldn't live with the shame and had to confess. In other words, the movie had revealed the truth. But you see, this is not the end of the story. Now we have a problem. The students. On the 9th of April, five days after the confession, the news broke and was spread nationwide. Understandably, it became the top news. The authorities admitted that the four students had been mistakenly arrested and released them from custody, of which they had been held for around one year. Fortunately, it wasn't longer, but of course any time would have been too long if they were innocent. This leaves some unanswered questions, however. If the students were innocent, why were they held for so long? 
and why had they previously confessed to the crime during interrogations? Well, the students would talk extensively with the press upon release, and they had some fairly shocking things to say. It turns out they went through a terrible ordeal. They were subjected to up to 20 hours of questioning a day in some circumstances. They were screamed at, roughed up, and even beaten during interrogations in an attempt to force them to confess to what had happened. Direct quotes from the students include things like, I was scared because I would be tortured by the detectives, so I made a false confession. And also, a policeman came in at around 3am and screamed, You're lying! punched me, and pulled my arm. On the next day, the investigation became more rigorous. I was handcuffed behind my back and forced to sit up straight from morning until night. I was also ordered to sit with my hands up, and if I lowered them, I was hit, and the officer screamed, Confess you did it with the knife. But there's more. They were also deprived of food and sleep. The Kyoto prefectural detectives that took over the investigation would do things like buy delicious expensive food and allow the students to take a single bite and then stop them from eating more. They would also force the students to stand against a wall and watch the detectives eat while not being allowed to eat themselves. This combined with the lengthy and relentless questioning meant that the struggles they went through both physically and mentally must have been extremely difficult. Remember how I said that the Nishijin police, who were not directly involved in the interrogations, were frustrated with the students because they believed that they were intentionally wasting the officer's time by stating many places where they hid the knife? Well, it turns out that wasn't the case at all. The students were so desperate for the intense interrogations to end that they were saying all the places they could think of in an eager attempt to end their ordeal. They were under so much pressure that they confessed, even though they were innocent, and were praying that the knife would be found and that their mistreatment would end. They were also lied to by the detectives with promises that if they confessed, they would receive shorter sentences or even pardons. Their stories about this mysterious man in the turtleneck shirt were all completely ignored during questioning. They were never investigated at all, even though all the students corroborated this story without contacting each other. In other words, they had individually said that they saw this man, but no investigation took place. You're probably wondering why the authorities did this. Why were they so harsh on the students? A couple of reasons are they likely just wanted it to be solved quickly and they were suffering from confirmation bias, but there is something else. You see, some of the students were either what is known as Burakumin or Zainichi Koreans. I won't go into too much detail about this since I've gone on a few tangents in this video already, but Burakumin, meaning Hamlet people, is a term that refers to the descendants of people who used to perform jobs that were considered sinful or unclean during Japan's past. Tanners, butchers, undertakers, leather workers, executioners, while all incredibly hardworking and performing vital jobs, were unfairly discriminated against and forced to live in hamlets away from the general public. It's a part of an awful feudal caste system, and while it is fortunately largely absent from modern Japanese life, people who lived in Barakumin areas were often treated as less than others even in the recent past. I touched upon it in another one of my videos if you're interested. And Zainichi Koreans, meaning Koreans in Japan, are ethnic Koreans who have permanent residency or full Japanese citizenship and either arrived in Japan before 1945 or are descended from parents who did. Due to their foreign roots, they are sadly looked down upon by native Japanese people. While things are a lot better in modern Japan, discrimination does regrettably persist to this very day, largely due to the sour relations between the two countries. Now the students did indeed attack Osamu and had owned up to that, so it's natural that some investigators believed that they were involved in Osamu's death. Past acts of delinquency and violence among the students also came to light, so I do understand how some not directly involved in the interrogations could honestly believe this. However, it is certain that some detectives discriminated against these poor, innocent men based purely on their backgrounds alone, as well as their own ignorant perceptions. When these stories were published for all of Japan to see, the people were very angry at the Kyoto police force. The general public, desperate to reforge Japan and correct its mistakes from before World War II, had great sympathy for the students and tensions were boiling. The movie Mahiru no Ankoku only heightened their sympathy and frustrations. They wanted justice. 
However, it wasn't only the public that took notice. The Japanese government, the national diet even got involved. To say that they were angry would be an understatement. The New Japan was very keen to remove the brutal aspects of its imperial past, and the actions here, reminiscent of the forces used to subjugate the population during the early 20th century, rocked the government. During a plenary session of the House of Councillors, Chairman of the Legal Affairs Committee Tokuchi Kameda discussed whether human rights violations had been committed during the interrogations, and demanded that both an apology and punishment be delivered to those responsible. The discussion went all the way to the top, and then Prime Minister Ichiro Hatoyama replied with, We will consider the matter depending on the results of an investigation. Tokuji travelled from Tokyo to Kyoto to conduct a three-day on-site investigation into the officers beginning on the 7th of May. He conducted extensive interviews of both the students and the authorities. When the officers only gave abstract rebuttals or excuses for the allegations, Tokuji claimed that, I cannot deny that it has deepened my suspicions that the students were coerced into confessions. He made a report on the 17th of May, and on the 31st of the same month, the Committee of Judicial Affairs stated, In view of recent incidents, such as the misidentification case by the Kyoto District Public Prosecutor's Office, in which the authorities had misjudged the fundamentals of criminal investigations, carelessly arrested and detained innocent persons, coerced confessions, assaulted and tortured, the government should actively ensure the investigators respect human rights, get rid of the self-righteous attitudes of the police and prosecutors, and change the old-fashioned tendency towards investigations based on assumptions and whitewashing. The government of Japan must, therefore, swiftly ensure the human rights are thoroughly instilled in the investigators, and that the police and prosecutors are thoroughly corrected in their operations in order to ensure that the fundamental rights of people are protected. The government then made changes to how interrogations and investigations are done across the country, passing new regulations to prevent the same thing from happening again in the future. New rules were put in place for the courts too, to make sure that all evidence was taken into account and personal prejudices by prosecutors was subdued. The authorities were ordered to weed out discrimination and treat all suspects equally regardless of their backgrounds. As for the authorities directly involved in the Gobanchoi incident, they all denied that the students were mistreated. Even the chief at the Criminal Affairs Division at the Ministry of Justice tried to defend the officers involved. He said, There is no truth to the claim of mistreatment. Mr. Y's confession may have been an attempt to save his friends and take the blame alone, or maybe out of a sense of decency. Kyoto Public Prosecutor Chuzo Morishima received disciplinary measures as a result of foul play, and eventually resigned. The head detective of the Nishijin Police Force also received disciplinary measures and resigned, and others were punished too. The government didn't just try to sweep it under the rug, but actively used it to try to reform the way things were done. So I guess you could say that some good came from this. But still, this isn't the end of the story. Since the reveal, you've probably been wondering, why? Why did Hisao Sato do this? Well, to understand this, we have to go all the way back to the beginning, when a chance encounter sealed Osamu's fate that night. Let's go back to the bar. As we know, Osamu, his brother, and their two friends were very drunk, and during that fun night, Osamu bumped into someone before punching them in an inebriated standoff. That person was Hisao the culprit of the crime. As mentioned before, the fight was broken up by a female employee. What Hisao revealed after this confession though, was that even though it was Osamu who started it, that had punched him, the worker had told Hisao to leave the bar instead, while the friend group went back to having fun. Hisao felt so frustrated by this. Why did he have to leave? Why was he treated like the bad guy when it was the friend group that had been loud and obnoxious? What did he do to deserve this? Hisao had to abandon his food and drink, pay, and leave the bar, all for reasons out of his control. Irritated, he began walking around Gobancho trying to cool off. He was fuming at Osamu, at the bar, at the world, and pacing around the area trying to forget about it. Just as he was starting to calm down and get over what happened, someone came running out of the darkness and bumped into him. Hisao couldn't believe it. It was Osamu. Something inside Hisao snapped. The anger boiled up within him yet again. He shouted towards Osamu, 
You were the one who punched me before, referring to the altercation at the bar, and out of his jacket pocket came a knife. During his confession, Hisao also thought that Osamu had come after him to continue what was started in the bar, so he felt threatened by him. He claimed that Osamu had a different look on his face, which made him fear for his well-being and feel compelled to do something to protect himself. Hisao struck Osamu twice in the back, and immediately after he did, the students showed up. Because it was so dark, they had no idea what had just transpired and set upon Osamu as Hisao fled the scene. It was here in the scuffle when Osamu's blood unknowingly spread to the two students' trousers. Hisao ran east for a while until he happened upon a public toilet. Believing it could be the perfect place to wash away some of the evidence, he quickly entered. It was dark, so as he did, he encountered a girl who was already in there washing her hands and barged past her. He didn't see her at first due to the poor visibility. And yes, in case it wasn't obvious by now, Yasuko Muramatsu, the witness who testified on behalf of the students, was telling the truth all along. She hadn't lied at all. In a newspaper article she wrote herself, she said the following. Suddenly on the 1st of March, I was summoned by Prosecutor Morishima. He said, someone asked you to do this, to which I replied, I was not asked. Eventually he started saying insulting things like, Cool your head. The world is laughing at you. Your name will be tarnished. You won't be able to find work or find a husband. You will go to jail for a long time. And your father will suffer because of this. He even said, Tell me what I want and I'll let you out immediately. If you don't, you'll go to jail. This continued from 11.30am until 7pm. Finally I was given an hour to eat. I was told I could eat there or go out to eat, so I went out. I thought, if I tell them what happened and they don't listen, where should I go with the truth? I then struggled to decide who would be the best person to contact before finally searching for attorney Mayabori's number and calling him. He said, if they're going to investigate like that, I'll go down. At around 10.30pm, prosecutor Morishima came into the room and said, why did you call a lawyer? And I replied with, because you're trying to get a false report. After this, I was investigated a little more and was finally shown an arrest warrant. I said, There is no reason for me to receive something like this. Please tell me why you're giving it to me. I asked repeatedly. On the back of the arrest warrant was written, Even though she didn't see the man, she said she lied in court when she said she did. Eventually she gave in and recanted her statement, and even though her words were the truth as proven by Hisao after his confession, she was pressured to lie and take back her witness testimony out of fear of being arrested and thrown into jail. The fact that a witness who told the truth was coerced into lying in order to prosecute innocent people was heavily criticised and was another point which was used to rightfully punish some members of the authorities. Now back to Hisao. After Hisao washed the blade and hand towel in the sink, he left the public bathroom and ran all the way home, where he went to try to get some sleep and forget what had happened. He, like the others, had been drinking after all, and this had also played a role in his actions. The next day, he put the knife, hand towel and white turtleneck shirt in a jug and buried it in the garden of his home. And there it remained for a year, until he saw that movie, until the guilt he felt overcame him and caused him to do the right thing. Hisao confided in his sister's husband about what he did and spoke to his mother. They decided to go to the authorities with the lawyer from the law firm where Hisao's sister worked as a clerk. For confessing to the crime and setting the record straight, showing genuine remorse for his actions, being forthcoming with information, displaying how he was provoked, exposing the injustice that went on and taking into account what happened at the bar, Hisao Sato was sentenced to three years imprisonment and a three year suspended sentence. The students and the witness received apologies and their false charges were removed from their records. The students' studies were badly affected by the incident, but they were able to pick up where they left off. Almost nothing is known about them, but it seems they went on to live normal lives. I hope that the trauma of this ordeal didn't affect them too much and they were able to have peace. It is said that Osama's brother felt great guilt over what happened that night. The fact that he ran so fast and lost his brother in the darkness weighed upon his life. Like the students, I hope he was able to find peace. 
it wasn't his fault after all. Chief Public Prosecutor Kumazawa of the Kyoto District Public Prosecutor's Office issued a statement saying, I'm sorry for the failings of the prosecutor's office. Given the circumstances at the time, indicting the four students was unavoidable. I completely regret the flaws of the investigation. While it may not seem like much in terms of reflection, it's good to see that at least some people didn't try to hide things and fully acknowledge their mistakes here in regards to the incident. Upon Prosecutor Morishima's resignation for his misdeeds, Yasuko said, At first, I really resented Prosecutor Morishima. I thought I would hate him for the rest of my life, but after learning that he had submitted his letter of resignation, I felt pity rather than sympathy. Experts have also weighed in on the incident. In regards to officers denying that any mistreatment took place, Kazuo Hirotsu said, How is it possible that four students falsely confessed if they were not coerced? Why did they need to make such false statements? I do believe they, they were mistreated. Hiroshi Masaki, the writer of the book that the movie that solved this crime, Mahiro no Ankoku, is based on, said, Preservation of not only oneself, but of one's position and career advancement are at the forefront of the officials. In other words, he said the authorities were not so forthcoming about admitting to their crimes because they wanted to protect themselves and their jobs. Expert Taiko Hirabashi said, Officials are reluctant to use new scientific methods in their investigations and continue to use outdated ones from the previous era. This is a very important point because it shows how officers still adopt their harsh tactics and don't want to change and don't want to use the more scientific fair practices of the post-war period. And that's the case in a nutshell pretty much. While lessons were learned, Japan continues to have problems with forced confessions even to this day. Things have improved drastically since the early 20th century and since this case, but it still has a long way to go. I'm just glad that the innocent were eventually let go and that Osamu's family could get some kind of closure for what had happened. Thank you for watching my 42nd YouTube video. If you liked it, feel free to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you wish to see more videos like this about Japan. It's stories like this that show how much darkness can have an impact on something. It was dark so Osamu and his brother got separated. It was dark so the students didn't see what happened. It was dark so the witness's testimony was put into question. It was dark so Osamu bumped into Hisao. I wonder if anything different would have happened if it took place during the day. I think Hisao can be commended for turning himself in. He could have kept quiet and gotten away with it easily, but his guilty conscience and genuine regret for his actions allowed him to do the right thing in the end. He certainly did something terrible and I'm not trying to excuse that at all, but I think most would not have done what he did. Someone with fewer morals would have not been so forthcoming. But on the other hand, I do wonder what would have happened if Hisao didn't watch that movie. Would his actions have been any different? Would he have confessed? Some doubt so. Japan has a terrible but deserved reputation for forced confessions, and this is one of the more famous cases. As mentioned, things have improved, but the country still needs to do more to protect innocent people from being convicted for things that they didn't do. They need to look back at this case, one of many, to see what is wrong with their systems and do better. Anyway, I think I've rambled on long enough, so I'll end things here. Until next time, goodbye. Kyoto Robato in the flesh, or rather in the hazard suit. Um, uh, so I got a lot of feedback on my last video about how people enjoyed the Google Maps bonus stuff, so I thought I'd do it again, except take it to another level and actually go to the location, actually go to Gobancho. Uh, so here I am walking to Gobancho. Uh, you may be wondering why I'm recording at home rather than on video, but the audio didn't come out very well. It was too quiet, so you can't really hear what's going on, and, and so I thought I'd just re-record the audio. But yeah, um, I hope you enjoy it, and let's get going. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, most of Gobancho was dismantled once those new laws came into place that stopped uh, sort of dubious industries. But uh, this building right here is, is one of the original buildings. In fact, this is 300 years old. It, it's, it's a very old building that operates as a restaurant. And, uh, you know, it looks really cool, the, all the wood uh, and uh, 
you know, just very traditional, typical Japanese building. It just looks very cool. My camera skills really, really suck, but um, the building coming up on the left here, uh, beyond this dark brown building, is also an original building from when Gobancho was still thriving. It It's another restaurant, and it operates as a yakiniku restaurant, or a grilled meat restaurant. But what it used to be uh, is a, um, well, a place where men would go to uh, interact with women. Yes, one of those establishments. <laughs> and that's what it used to be. Uh, in the past before these new laws came into place. Okay, jumping all around, uh, sorry. Uh, we're, we're jumping into Google Maps because I wanted to show you a building that unfortunately was destroyed um, quite recently in 2018. It's no longer there, but this building here that you're seeing on the screen is the, the, the bar, the restaurant, the establishment that the friend group went to to drink and where everything started, where Osamu punched Hisao, where, you know, they they got into a fight with the student group and they all, all, all everything started here. Uh, this 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 place is called uh, Furusato, I think. I, 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 I haven't found much information about what it used to be called, but I did find a couple of sources that said it was called Furusato, which means basically... Uh, hometown I think if, if it's the same meaning as the kanji the problem is it was written in uh, hiragana so the meaning could be uh, many things but um, but yeah this is this is the building which as I said was destroyed and turned into a home <laughs> just a regular home which is a bit of a shame because it looks very beautiful as you can see I actually used images of it in my video because I, I as you know, if you've been a long-time fan, you know that I try to incorporate uh, real locations, the images of real locations as much as possible, and this is one of them. But yeah, this is where it happened, and um, again, it looks like such a beautiful building. I, re I really like Japanese architecture and just traditional Japanese buildings and temples and shrines and stuff. I think they're really cool, and... Uh, I think th this is one of the more famous, or sh oh, I should say was, because it no longer exists, but it was one of the most famous buildings in this area. And it did survive the uh, sort of demolition of Gobancho when it, when it transferred to a sort of uh, quote-unquote pleasure district into a residential district. This is um, something that survived, and yeah, it's a shame that it's gone. But um, yeah, like... Now it looks like this, which is kind of a very typical Japanese modern home. Uh, and I think it's lost a bit of its character, this area, but this is what happens. This is the passage of time. So This is the road where the friend group ran away from the students. They ran right down this road. It's very, very different from what it used to be. It's much wider, uh, of course, uh, and much more open and lit. But um, yeah, this is the road. And this is the crossroads where uh, Osamu was stabbed by Hisao, uh, where he bumped into Hisao and got had the wounds inflicted upon him and then the students caught up with him. This is the sort of fatal location, this crossroads right here. It's very different from how it used to be, of course, as I said, with the other road, but um, this that is the exact location where it happened. Um, and this is the road right now where Hisao ran away uh, after committing the that horrible deed. He ran east down this road. Um, in case it isn't obvious right now, uh, this is all very unscripted. So forgive me if I'm really bad at talking. I'm really bad at this kind of thing, but I, I, I do like to sort of dabble into new territory. And yeah... Um, yeah, the old buildings are still around, dotted around. Not all of them are gone, but most of them are gone. On the road that Hisao fled down is Hodoji Temple. This temple used to take in the remains of female workers once they passed away, because if they didn't have any money to pay for funerals or anything like that, this temple would take in their remains. So it was pretty important during the Gobancho times when it was a pleasure district because it could help take care of the burial of the workers who likely didn't have any family or money to do it themselves. I think that's 
it's an interesting story, an interesting part of this history of this area. Sorry, back to Google Maps. I realized that the video I took of this area wasn't very good, so uh, I, I thought I'd just jump into Google Maps to give you a better idea of uh, the area. And I mean, not that my other video, not, not that the videos I took myself were any good really, but uh, just it, this one was especially bad. So this is, this is also a crossroads, but what, why this is significant to the story, to the incident, the Gobancho incident, is this area here was where the public bathroom, public toilet used to be, uh, where Yasuko was washing her hands, where Hisao ran into her, and, uh, you know, where the, the witness testimony uh, could be made, like, well, where the witness saw uh, Hisao, um... And which was very, very important to the case. So, and it, it's actually right in front of the temple we were just talking about. Uh, temple is here. So, um, yeah, uh, again, the area is completely different to what it used to be, um, but just an interesting part of the story, I guess. Okay, so the next location I'm going to show you is Gobancho's most famous location, and it has been for a long time. It is Senbon Nikatsu. Senbon Nikatsu used to be the headquarters of the female workers in the area. Um, but of course, once such activities were made illegal under the new laws and the pleasure district was dismantled, it, the building was repurposed and made into a cinema, a cinema that still operates to this very day. It is, however, a very special cinema because it shows exclusively, um, well, adult type movies and videos yes those type those those kinds of videos is what this cinema shows exclusively and i will have to blur the bottom of the cinema because it has all kinds of pictures of uh women um yeah they're not wearing much uh, put it that way um but yeah it's a very interesting building in the sense that it's been operating for a very, very long time. The price is incredibly cheap. I mean, not not that I've been. I, I want to make it clear I have not been into this establishment. Um, I didn't even want to get close to it while I'm filming because I was worried about so, so, someone calling the police on me or something. So I, I didn't even want to get close to it. I kept my distance. But just seeing the prices, it's very, very cheap. And I don't think it's operating to make a profit. I think it's operating purely to keep this part of Gobancho's history alive. This is one of this is one of the few places in Gobancho that sort of has that hangover of the area's past. So um yeah, it's very interesting. This building has actually changed quite a lot. Um, I show I actually show it in the beginning of my video when I when I first introduced Gobancho, uh, you can see it. It looks very different, but you can see an image of what it used to look like. And then it got up. I think it got upgraded in two thousand and fifteen. Uh, the the bit the sign at least got upgraded. It used to be a very sort of retro style sign, and then they replaced it with this kind of boring one that you're seeing in the video which is a shame. But um, yeah, this building has a lot of history. I wonder what kind of activities have gone on in it over the years. And that's the end of the video. Um, this was a very spontaneous thing. It's unscripted. It's very, very rough. So it probably wasn't very good. I just watched it back and it was so bad. But <laughs> if I hopefully some of you enjoyed this little walk around Gobancho. Um, if you did, uh, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, and I hope to see you in the next one. Until next time, goodbye.